Welcome, or hopefully welcome back, to another episode of the Reliability Matters podcast. In today's episode, we're exploring automated optical inspection, or AOI, and X-ray inspection technology within the electronic assembly industry. Joining us are two experts who bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table. Joel Scutchfield is the General Manager of SMT and Semicon Business Operations and Director of Sales at Ko Young, Manufacturers of Automated Inspection and Precise Measurement Systems with its headquarters in Seoul, Korea and R&D centers around the world. Joel has been with Ko Young for just under 10 years. Also joining us is Jesper Leike, the CEO at Viscom, a manufacturer of inspection technologies, in particular for automated optical inspection and X-ray inspection. With headquarters in Hanover, Germany and offices worldwide, Jesper has been with Viscom for 14 years. Both Joel and Jesper are widely considered to be subject matter experts on inspection technology. In this episode, we'll delve into the principles and applications of AOI and X-ray inspection, discussing how these technologies are revolutionizing the electronic assembly industry. We'll explore the latest trends, challenges, best practices, and future directions, providing you with a comprehensive understanding of how these inspection methods are critical to maintaining high standards in electronics manufacturing. Whether you're an industry professional, a tech enthusiast, or just curious about the intricacies of electronic assembly, this episode promises to offer valuable insights and expert perspectives on the inspection technologies that are driving both innovation and quality in the field. So sit back, relax, and join us for an enlightening conversation about inspection technology. And it all begins right now. Stick around. This is going to be good. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Joel Scutchfield, Jasper Leike, welcome to the program. I appreciate you guys being here today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, absolutely. Pleasure. Pleasure is ours, Mike. Oh, well, you're, you're, my- you're, you're, you're quite the, uh, the known source in, uh, in this space. Oh, well, like the rock star. Well, let's just, let's just change the episode to make it about me. Let's just do that. Huh? <laughs> Good idea. I don't know. We probably don't have enough time. <laughs> um, anyway, thanks guys. I really appreciate your, your willingness. And one thing we started talking before we went on air, uh, about this, but one thing I really appreciate about our industry and I, I don't know if it's completely unique to our industry, but it's certainly unusual amongst industries in general, is even though many of us are all competitors, um, there is a tremendous amount of collaboration uh, within our industry. And we see that at technical conferences and symposiums, and you know we're all we all have the sales team out there trying to sell our wares and and be unique and stand out, but in the in the technical world, there's an awful lot of collaboration and sharing of information and, and uh, a joint mutual interest in, in educating. And uh, I think that's what makes our industry um, perhaps a little bit unique um, I think compared we're all to some others. Po- trying to pull on the same end of the road, right? Try to expand this industry for, for the betterment of uh, everyone, right? And uh, all of us Absolutely. that are involved and you know, now we're in this phase of trying to recruit the next generation to come in and uh, take over for, uh, you know, those of us that uh, will at some point uh, find our way to the golf course <laughs> yes. on a more regular basis. Golf course and, or a uh, beach or just fill in the blank. Yeah, absolutely. Come you on, go. young people, oh, that, get going, right? They're, yeah, we're waiting that, that's for that's you. challenging. It's a whole other topic, but uh, but it's but it's a real one, right, Mike? But you know, it makes its way into all these every episode I have on on whatever subject we're talking about specifically. Um, the the great uh, retirement, the silver tsunami, all the you know the, the grain out of our industry, however you want to put it, it it comes up because newer, younger engineers are leaving university and coming into our space, and you know we've we've determined that universities teach. You know, if you if you have a, a EE degree or or a BS in you know electrical engineering or whatever the case may be, um, you know you you understand how electrons work. You don't ne- necessarily understand um, optical lens. You know, one optical lens over another, or yeah, or, or, or a, a squeegee a or, or squeegee yeah. pressure, or 
the best way to apply a thermocouple for temperature profiling. You know, that's that's just way too down a rabbit hole. That would be a, a, a 40 year degree, you know, which we just call work experience. So there's a lot of yeah. tribal information in our space and that's why we do the show so that we can record some of that tribal information and maybe cover some of the points that one doesn't discover until they show up for the first day of work and, you know, get the deer in the headlights look. Um, Give them a head start. That's good. Yeah, exactly. Kind of this information vault, you know, by mind melding all the inf great information industry experts like yourselves have and, and documenting it somewhere. So Absolutely. let's start with a comparison. Um, I'd like to start at the, the very basic uh, level, kind of a 30,000 foot view level for the sake of some of my audience that may not be de quite as deep down the, the inspection rabbit hole as, as uh, you are. Uh, so let's start with, you know, a basic comparison of the, of the different types of optical um, tools uh, for inspection from microscopes to uh, AOI equipment and everything in between and then the different types of that AOI. This give us a um, kind of a 30,000 foot view on um, what various technologies can, what they're capable of, and at what point should someone consider upgrading from a, you know, like a jeweler's loop or a, or a simple microscope to something a little bit more uh, sophisticated and, and, and with more capabilities. So um, uh, I'll let whoever wants to start can start, and then we'll just kind of pile on from there. I'll, I'll, take, the, uh, I'll, I'll take you into the Wayback Machine real quick here. Oh, right, you're because Peabody, because you're, you're you, Peabody you, and you, Sherman. We grew up with you, the same you, cartoons. <laughs> that's right. You mentioned, uh, you know, the, the basic manual inspection tools uh, that were, uh, you know, that were available back in the in the late 80s when we when we you and I got into this industry. And uh, and that's exactly right. I, I mean, I remember using the, the, you know, the Luxo ring lamps and and uh, and then watching that transition, you know, from my manufacturing days. Uh, where we didn't have automation in in that particular uh, 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 time within this 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 evolution of our industry, uh, up through moving on to the sales side in the mid '90s, and starting to see some of the some of the tools that were coming into play and very basic, uh, you know, migrating now from 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 ring lamps and, and magnifying lenses to uh, to tabletop uh, inspection systems, laser based for for checking uh, solder paste uh, shape, solder bricks, and and some of the other offline tools, the 2D tools that were used uh, initially, to then you know finally into the uh, the higher level uh, higher level uh, means of automation, uh, beginning in the 2D world, and then and then eventually uh, eventually into the uh, the 3D world. Uh, actually, with our uh, introduction of the the 3D AOI system back in in 2010. Uh, and then, uh, and then everything in between. I think, you know, from from our perspective, uh, and I'll let I'll let Jesper add on to this. You know, we we try to impress upon the fact that look, there's there's a lot of things in the mix here, right? There's there's 2D still in existence. That's kind of where AOI came from from a, from an automation perspective early on. And even in the 3D world, there's 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 different mechanisms. There's more A inferometry. There's laser based, et cetera, et cetera. Some combinations of both, uh, but there's also uh, a big differentiation in the use of the the individual technologies that I'm that I'm talking about and how we get the results that we are providing. So you know, I like to say, uh, you know, what's under the hood really matters, right? There's there's the right kind of information. Uh, in, in particular, in the 3D world, which is you know very parametric, uh, objective, measurement based, then it has to be gotten the right way, right? You have to again, what what's under the hood does matter. Uh, the the accuracies of the subsystems, and then the right amount, right? In this particular day and age of uh, of data usage and, and data really being now the the, the currency for smart factory realization and, and how it's utilized, you really need all three to, uh, you know, to be able to, to really take your, your business, you know, to the, to the highest levels that, that, that you can from a, from a, a the standpoint of, uh, you know, yield improvement, uh, cost reduction, uh, 
reduction of, of the human element, which is, again, back to the, uh, the, the comment we made earlier on. So it, it does run the spectrum. And, uh, and, you know, I think at this particular juncture, uh, most companies out there, unless you're really, really small, uh, have some level of automation, whether it's right. offline or inline. And then it's it's just a process of how you how you take that forward, how you decide to take that forward based on your needs or what you're trying to achieve, and then utilizing the various systems and technologies that are available. Well, you know, well before any of your companies were even in existence, uh, I used to use 3D inspection technology way before way before anything even plugged into the wall. You just had a, a, a giant magnifying glass, and you took the subject and you just rotated it <laughs> underneath it. Yes. Yeah, 3D, that, that was right? it. That, that was I mean, it. our eyes sees things in 3D. So, so you know, that was the the most basic. Now, you, it took you guys a lot yeah. of years to figure out how to have a computer do that. But, I mean, it was easy back in the day. Jesper, what's your take on the 30,000-foot uh, view of of the various technologies that are out there and their capabilities? No, as as, as Joel said, so, I mean, a microscope is, is actually absolutely good for, for some things. Uh, it, it has to do with your volume, uh, short short uh, description. Um, so if you produce one board, which I don't think many people do these days, but as your, Joel said, there are some automation uh, portion of it. So as, as soon as you have more than 10 or 20 boards, you would need some sort of automation, maybe not fully automated, semi-automated, uh, AOI, X-ray, manual X-ray, whatever. So there's always the, the, the need that needs to be, let's say, decided first. Um, obviously, uh, going out there and, and buy some equipment uh, is costly, uh, but of course, depends on your volume. There is a, a cost reduction in, in other ways where you you get the, the return rather quickly uh, sometimes because you have it automated. And, and you are more consistent, uh, machines catch defects more, uh, no offense to any, any uh, operators, but even myself, after looking at the same board for more than two minutes, I can't tell up and down anymore, and, and that's really what it is. Obviously, there are more skilled people than me to, that does that, or luckily. Um, I'm not a manual uh, human interface uh, optical inspector, um, but automation is absolutely key for, for getting a consistency uh, out the door, so we, the customer of of our customers are the ones benefiting up. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's a key, Jesper. That I mean, you know, quality is is the real driver here at the end of the day. And yes. people were able to get away with those less sophisticated systems for for many years uh, because of the complexities at the time and and, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, uh, you know, uh, the cost quality all contribute to to the need and and really is what's driven uh the automation and uh and and the advancement thereof yep agreed i love the way you guys answer questions because you there's like four questions that i had for you next and you and you've already <laughs> answered them this is great this is awesome i don't i, right, I can just sit done? here and ask one question and the whole show writes itself you, this is great you'll have you'll have an editless episode mike how about that exactly yeah that'll be a first um let, let's, uh, Jesper, you mentioned about, uh, I think you, you may have used the word uh, consistency or, or uh, something to that effect, how automation systems provide this level of, you know, kind of higher level of consistency. So let's um, dive into that a little bit. The original inspection system was these two things, you know, I'm pointing to my eyes for those listeners. Um, we just looked at, at boards and then as Boards and components got <laughs> miniaturized. Now you can't even see them. Uh, so even with my little, you know, cheater glasses, I still can't see half the components on a board. <laughs> so we started using magnifying glasses and loops and, and things like that. Um, and then companies like yours come along and they said, "Oh no, we can we can show you on a video screen, uh, you know, on, on a larger monitor, and and you can zoom in and out and do things like that." But originally, it was still an operator looking at the image. You guys brought the image to the person's eyes so they could interpret it. But ultimately, it was still an operator looking at an image. And um, you know, I'm reminded of, of uh, like MRI images and CAT scans and things like that in the medical world, where even a, a physician that ordered the scans 
is probably not going to read them. They're going to have a radiologist or whatever the position is called because they're experts at seeing patterns and randomness. <laughs> and and um, to me, it all looks like the old, uh, you know, over-the-air televisions that we grew up with when when the station went off the air. It was just snow, as we called it. And, and but, but they're seeing stuff out of that now. That's probably an extreme example, but the point I'm making is, uh, at some point, it, your job is to deliver more than just a clear image to the person who's seeing it. At some point, there needs to, a, to be able to provide a little bit more consistency um, and accuracy. Um, there's gotta be some computer-aided interpretation going on. So. At, at what point did automation systems, or, or inspection systems, I should say, uh, go from just a nice, clear, big image to interpretation of that nice, clear, big image? Is that, is, is that a clear question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if I can start that one. So, so yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of things uh, embedded in, in those questions. So, so one is, uh, to answer your last question first, uh, I, I don't know, uh, we have used uh, AI, quote-unquote, uh, or a version thereof for, for many, many years. Had I need to guess, I would say maybe eight, ten years ago or something like that, where where some sort of AI started where you needed some, some feedback from what you already had done in the past to make sure that what you have now is still being caught as defects or, or passes or whatever. So so there's definitely a, an aspect of it there as well that, that you need to have this, as I said earlier, you're right, uh, consistency. So one is that the machine is not only taking pictures, obviously, that there is a, a lot more to it than that. I'm sure Joe will, will agree to that. Um, so it has to do with a resolution, of course. It has to do with, with the software, of course, as well, how you interpret it. So so. The machine can do a lot for you, by all means, and, and it always has been able to do that, and, and we'll get to the future a little bit later in the podcast. But to go back eight, ten years, I mean, the, as you said, Mike, the, the machine would take pictures, and it would interpretate those in, in a certain way, but you would absolutely need that operator input, uh, uh, really reading out the, the images, and whatever the machine called out, this is a defect, this is a missing component, or a missing solder joint, or anything like that. There was a lot, lot more tuning back then uh, to to get to that level, and and these days, obviously, uh, I mentioned it already. AI is is a huge, huge help for for everybody else, ourselves included, as a manufacturer of machines. Um, but definitely, the key is that the customer and, and the end customer uh, obviously get a huge benefit from it as well. That the quality of of these products that that leave the the production floor is is by far way, way better than, than it was, um, let's say, 10 years ago. And for the most part, I would also claim it's it's uh, it's still a lot of effort. Don't get me wrong. And I know there's a lot more than, than what we're just mentioning here, but but it definitely helps all parties to get better at what they do. That That's the, the bottom line for sure. Excellent. Joel? To, to add on to, to just the, uh, one of the comments that, that Jesper made, uh, he's right. I mean, we go back 10, 10 years, even more, into the uh, original 2D systems that were, were introduced. Uh, and that was really the first, Mike, as you said, uh, uh, first run at, at utilizing technology to, to make a decision, right? To, to tell the operator, okay, this is what I'm seeing. Um, you have a choice. You can verify that I'm seeing it correctly or, or you can dispute it, right? And in that case, you're gonna tune, you're gonna do, you're gonna do other things. But in that 2D world, uh, there was a lot of uh, variability, and that still exists today because because uh, some uh, technology, some approaches being used still use uh, a, a larger element of the two D aspects uh, than 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 we would like to see. Okay, for for reliability in analysis, and what I mean by that is, you know, in the two D world, you're you're basically getting a top down view, right? The old bomb site uh, approach. And and you're you're subject to warpage. Uh, you're subject to uh, thickness differences. You're subject to a lot of variability, and and that played into really needing the operator even more so uh, to to make those uh, assisted determinations. 
I think things changed significantly with the introduction of the the 3D measurement based systems. Now, now we're taking all that variability out. Uh, ideally, we're not using those those 2D methodologies uh, to do things like body and lead tip find uh, because that's what that's what you use. That that body lead tip find sets all the other regions of interest in terms of what you're going to inspect for uh, solder. OCR, OCB, et cetera, et cetera. So if you don't get that right, you're in a world of hurt. That's where your false calls come from. So that's the the major advantage of the the three dimensional aspect is that we're using measurement based information. We're using again parametric, objective, concrete. It's not binary ones and zeros. It's it's very specific. And now from that, uh, everything becomes much more uh, repeatable and less dependent on the human aspect as uh, as your question alluded to initially Mike so hope that hope that helps just throw a little bit more into into how all that comes together absolutely you know there's two things that um, that, that we inspect for or there's two end goals for inspection is from my layman point of view as an inspection expert um, one is to um, prevent escapes, you know, things leaving the factory that would uh, not be uh, desired. But even more importantly, to prevent rework, to prevent the mistake from happening in general. Fix so, the process. There you go. Fix the process yeah. rather than mm-hmm. repair the board. Because, of course, we all know every time we rework something, you know, it adds another layer of you know, potential liability and, or risk. So and a lot more cost. <laughs> and a lot more cost. It takes usually longer to rework something than it did to build it in the first place. So, so tell me how inspection systems can um, maybe kind of not just prevent the ultimate escape, the great escape, but can actually um, fix the process or identify things in the process that have to be fixed so that there is no rework necessary. Maybe maybe that question kind of goes down the SPI, AOI rabbit hole. I'm not sure, but um, I'll tur- I'm will i not going to attempt to answer my own question. But um, uh, tell me how uh, one can use this type of technology to prevent the problem in the first place uh, before rework is necessary. Yep. Who so, wanna, you want to start? Go ahead. I'll, I'll start and then I'll let you talk afterwards. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, we already alluded to it a little bit as well, of course. So so it has to do with, let's say, the process itself. So so an optical uh, inspection system, an x-ray system is, is a process tool. So you can use it in, in many different ways. Uh, one of the ways would be, obviously, you fix your process. So it would uh, unbiased tell you your process and, and how you operate your other machines for, for that process. And it will not uh, let you down in, in many ways. That means it will absolutely find your defects and it will definitely tell you if, if you have a problem with the process somewhere. And that's definitely also the good news because you can improve a lot uh, when you get the right equipment in and it will tell you uh, even before you're uh, done with the product at the end of the line. So that's why you already mentioned it, Mike. There's SPIs, there's uh, post and pre-reflow AOIs. Um, so you can decide in your process where you want those test gates and process improvement uh, tools so you ensure that, that your manufacturing floor is, is producing uh, real non-defective boards and, and that you don't even have to process it afterwards as in rework it and, and uh, things of that nature. Yeah, and a, and a good example would be uh you know, what the SPI tool, solder paste inspection tool can, can do for you in, in the manufacturing process. And and we always recommend when we, when we walk into a a customer that has no inspection technology at all, aren't too many of them out there today, but uh, uh, we always recommend starting with SPI. I I think it's pretty widely known throughout the industry that, uh, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 70%, maybe more of the solder related defects that we, that we incur come from the print process, not necessarily the printer itself, but the print process and everything that, that goes along with it. Pace and just for the sake of my audience setup, who may not, stencil. and just for the sake of my audience that may not be quite um, 
as familiar with all these acronyms, SPI, solder paste inspection, um, as opposed right. to general inspection. This is a very specific inspection. Correct. Yeah. As soon as as soon as the uh, the paste has been deposited on the on the bare board itself, we wanna we wanna check it right then and there, right out of right out of the machine. We're gonna look for uh, position X Y. Uh, we're gonna look for thickness. We're gonna look for shape. We're gonna look for all kinds of uh, anomalies, hot spots, trends that that might indicate that maybe that print process is is not in control to the degree that it needs to. Uh, to ensure that we're not building in solder-related defects, and and again, uh, why why not eliminate that seventy percent of potential defects right out of the gate, rather than rather than start with an AOI machine uh, optical inspection further down the line, where we're just verifying that it, hey, the the print process is out of control <laughs> and too late. Now we're back into the rework. So. You know, we start with the SPI, and then, and as Jester said, there's there's multiple points at a pre-reflow, uh, in a pre-reflow environment. Now we can verify that it's the right part, it's in the right location, it's the right polarity, it's all of those things uh, before the the solder joint is formed, uh, which again reduces cost if if there is a problem. We also now use that data to make adjustments to the to the placement system if needed. Maybe we've got a problem with a feeder, a spindle, a nozzle. We can we can tie the information uh, specifically back to those contributing factors. And then and then finally, uh, in in the, the base uh, assembly process post reflow, now we're we're looking at the solder joints themselves, right? Are they are they uh, acceptable? Are they meeting IPC standards for whatever class you're building to? Uh, you know, did something happen in the oven? Did parts fly off? You know, did, you know, is there, now do I have an oven issue, right? So when we talk about process control, as, as Jesper alluded to, that's that's how we're doing it, right? We use those multi-point uh, islands of, of inspection, basically sensors to provide us with data that, that tells us uh, either things are great or we need to make some adjustments. And, and as we go forward now, that's becoming much more automated uh, with AI and automatic feedback and self-healing and all those kinds of things to the point where the operator doesn't have to be as involved in, uh, in doing any of that. So that's, that's exciting. That's, that's, that's our future. That's our industry 4.0 smart factory realization initiative that we're all, we're all working toward and, uh, and quickly on a, on a track to achieve uh, already are in, in, uh, in many cases. Well, I think, um, Everything you're describing is certainly the, the building blocks to the so-called lights out factory. I'm not a big fan yep. of that term because I, I I take these words very literally. I'm like, no, I mean, there's someone's got to sweep stuff off the floor. I mean, there's yeah. it can't be completely lights out. That would be a little scary. But I but the the um, the general context of not relying on operators to make split second decisions, you know, uh, red green go no go pass fail kind of decisions. Um, and learning, uh, you know, one of the advantages that um, AI has is, you know, first of all, I, I do, do not like, and I've railed on this before, um, on this and other shows, um, I'm not a fan of the term artificial intelligence uh, because there's nothing artificial about it. We learn by reading. You know, we go to school, they teach us things, we have to read things. It's acquired intelligence, and it, I think one really of the reasons is. there's so much fear and there's a basis for the fear, obviously, but one of the reasons the fear is even more exaggerated is because of the word artificial. When we go to school, we're not artificially taught. We, we acquire knowledge. AI acquires knowledge the same way. It just reads a whole lot faster. You know, it's, it's read over a billion books, uh, and, yep. and, <laughs> and it, it's generative, so it forms opinions. So are we. It's, it's not human, but it's learning from humans. We taught it everything it knows. And it doesn't know anything that we have not taught it yet, or it has not learned from us. So acquired intelligence. But AI, certainly uh, in your world, just makes a whole lot of sense because operators, humans, cannot make decisions on the fly fast enough. Uh, and we don't have, I mean, eventually if we do something long enough, muscle memory sets in, but we don't have, you know, infinite memory. And 
you know, computers, algorithms, and it has infinite memory, and it can actually start weighing risks like an underwriter would, you know, like, um, and, and all that. And, and I would imagine, uh, going a little off topic here, but I would imagine that beyond, or going back, maybe the original motivation for automated inspection is to make sure that the, 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 the right component is in the right place, the polarity is correct, it's not skewed, it's not standing straight up, you know, whatever, some obvious soldering defects. And, and I would imagine that uh, with the technology that's just evolved rapidly in your world, that uh, things like maybe counterfeit detection and other, you know, maybe less um, obvious uh, applications can come out of that, right? Because if you're inspecting a component to make sure its polarity is correct. You're, you're seeing a lot, of th a lot of things beyond the polarity, and you're capturing data well be beyond positive and negative, right? Um, so what are some of the other maybe less obvious? I, I said counterfeit detection is you know, throwing one example out, but what are some of the other uh, additional benefits beyond what the stereotypical basic view of the benefits of inspection uh, provide. Uh, throw some examples out uh, beyond counterfeit. You want to start with that, Joel? Then I'll jump in afterwards. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it and uh, and and I'll let you close it out. Uh, interesting. Uh, IBM Watson is is has been running an ad. I, I don't know if it was Forbes magazine or, or or where I saw it recently, but something to the effect. It's very simple. It said. Uh, uh, well, something, something to the effect that if you are going to rely on AI to to make a decision for you, uh, you first must need to understand uh, what it's doing, right, and and how it's doing what it's doing, and I think that's really the key. And Mike, you 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 alluded to the fact that you know we we are teaching it, right, and so when we as manufacturers of of solutions i guess solutions based uh systems sit down to better understand how we're going to utilize ai we we first have to answer answer those questions right what first of all what is our objective what are we trying to do here okay and then we start with uh, making sure that we have the expertise in place to train those algorithms properly so the generative piece can can take over. So it and it takes time. It's it's uh, there's a lot of stopping and starting, right? There's a lot of uh, data acquisition, data analysis. Well, what are the results? Go back, acquire more data, analyze more data, analyze the results. Continue and and, and while this is going on, we're continuing to uh, refine and and develop the the algorithm algorithms themselves so you know there there's there's many areas where where this can be applied obviously in the in the programming uh effort to to automate programming uh, more completely uh, again remove removing uh, human uh dependence aspect uh creating uh, situations where now we can allow the system to learn what what various defects look like so it's better apt to uh catch or or uh highlight something that that is an anomaly uh, and then certainly when we're when we're talking about closed looping processes where you know in our case we have uh, what we call our, our kpo tools our, our co-young process optimizer for both the print process and the pick and place process where we can literally take full control of the screen printer uh, for things like squeegee speed, pressure, and and snap off uh, of the uh, of the stencil, and doing that by using machine learning and an ongoing analysis of trends and automatically making adjustments for those things. So it's completely hands off. A similar uh, in the pick and place uh, environment, where again we're detecting pre reflow what those various anomalies are and, and able to automatically adjust. So again, you have to really, uh, you have to have the data, right? You have to have the right kind of data set. Uh, you have to be able to uh, construct your, your proprietary AI engine, building it around that, 
that data set that you know very well and then applying it using you know your your process uh, expertise to adjust and and tune those algorithms uh, as you go and that's that's really the 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 base application for uh, for how it's being used and and again the uh, the application I touched on a few of them I don't want to I don't want to steal any Jesper's thunder here so I'll let him I'll let him talk a little bit about uh, about their aspects as well but that that's just a base uh, approach and uh, and it certainly is as as we've all uh, noted uh, something that we'll continue to use and and develop and expand as we go forward excellent Jesper. Yeah, no, I, I would agree, of course. I mean, the approach for, for all of us is, let's say, somewhat the same. Uh, want more data, and, and the data will, will get processed. So, I mean, 40 years ago, when, when we started, I mean, the AOI machine back then, uh, computer power and, and uh, let's say, hardware, and, and the, the human interface back then was obviously vastly different than, than what it is today. So so the, the driver there was, was uh, let's say, throughout those 40 years has been, uh, let's say, data. And and lately, obviously, with the AI, you get a lot more data. But it's also the same thing as as you uh, both Joel and Mike, you guys said. They say garbage in, garbage out. So so you need to make sure that that you feed in the the right stuff, uh, chat GBC and and whatnot these days. I mean, you 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 get something out, but but you don't really know where it comes from. And and that's exactly what Joel uh, was saying as well. That that you you want to keep that closed process. A closed loop interface, we call it, but yeah, the same thing that that you have the SPI speaking to the AOI, and then further down to the AXI or MXI to to narrow down. Okay, you don't need to waste time on on uh, inspecting in details this board and this location, but it already knows that from the SPI or AOI. Well, I know I have some abnormalities there, so you want to focus and maybe strengthen the inspection in certain certain areas of the board where where uh, one of the SDI or AOI machine or whatever found some, some potential defects and then you can drill down and, and have the machine automatically select that and say, well, I found this chip resist or whatever. It didn't look right. It may not quite look like a defect, but definitely look a little bit closer. And that's when further machines down the line can then look closer, uh, focused, laser focused on, on those exact areas and components that was called out earlier and therefore also eliminate uh, false calls that, that obviously nobody wants. So it kind of double checks or takes an extra look at, at certain components that was found by the machine further down the line. Uh, so obviously you want those stop gates, as, as Joel talked to, uh, about earlier. You want to stop after the SPI and make sure that everything is okay. You want to stop uh, before you, you feed it into the oven. And yes, you want to stop after the oven, make sure that the 3D profile of, of the solder joint looks right and and even components on the shields and things like that, you want to make sure that A, the shield is, is located uh, correctly. And of course, then you need the X-ray uh, to look under those shields and, and make sure that everything will sort up correctly. So it all comes together, of course, and, and it's all uh, data-driven. It, it's a matter of, of where you can grab the data, if that's an SPI, an AOI, or X-ray for that matter. It all, at the end, feeds up to, to whatever uh, NES software that, that's used, as any other company, we all have our own. Um, but of course, a lot of our customers have their own as well. So we just need to feed into that system. And, and the more data you can feed in, the, the better you, uh, result you get out. Excellent. And you said the word X-ray, which is perfect segue. Um, one of the, one of the um, to me, I mean, X-ray has been around for over a hundred years. And it's just, it's amazing to me to think that back then, you know, we, we had the ability technically to see through things, right? That, that was amazing. Easy. Um, the, the, I remember the early days of BGAs, before X-ray was it used, really. you know, in our industry, the way it is now. Um, the way to inspect under a BGA was with this oblique angle and viewer. It was basically a, uh, a microscope with a little pri prism, and it, it just looked underneath the, the VGA. Of course, back then, first row, were all the way around the first outside, row. Right? <laughs> you knew that the first row was at least the, the the edge facing side of the first row was soldered properly, right? You had no idea about the hundreds of other, you know, solder balls underneath. You know what they're like. But I guess you could make a statistical analysis or an assumption based on it. But um, but that was how you know, that was the only way to do it. And then 
you know, some clever person, maybe it was you, Jesper, I don't know, but some clever person in our industry <laughs> said, wait a minute, you know, we use x-rays for so many things, let's use it for this. And x-rays born into, into our industry. Um, can you explain, uh, Jesper, I'm going to focus this on you because you, you guys yeah. do make x-ray equipment. Um, and maybe by the end of the episode, Ko Young will start making x-ray equipment too. But uh, they're probably working on it right this sure. second. Welcome. Right. Uh, well, welcome to the world, right? Um, but explain the, what role x-ray inspection plays in, in the inspection world and what differentiates it from you know, other, other types of technologies. Yeah, so, so I already alluded to it a little bit. So, so optical inspection, SPIAY, it's, it's all visual. What you can see, the machine can see. Obviously, it can see it a lot better, higher resolution cameras, all that. Uh, the 3D aspect, of course, as well, where, where we have different ways of, of measure the volume. Um, but for X-ray, there are the, the things that you cannot see uh, with the naked eye. So let's say a polarity mount, of course, anybody can see that it's at least either like a laser marking or, or some sort of uh, mark on the, on the board or on the component itself. Um, but X-ray, you can look through. And, and by the way, the VGAs uh, 20 years ago, they were huge compared to what we see today, obviously. Uh, BGA balls and whatever, they have shrunk significantly. So so here as well, you need the high resolution, uh, best case in line or manual inspection as well. So there are, let's say, two different categories. One is more the, the lab style manual inspection where you can do either uh, uh, lab analysis or you can do some sampling testing or you can go all in and then do a full inline x-ray inspection where where every single board is, is inspected. Or even if, if you want to combine the two a little bit with what we talked about earlier, optical, then you can even combine that in, in uh, best case, one machine to save floor space, and you can have optical and X-ray in the same machine and, and working as, as a team perfectly together. But again, X-ray is, is, is something you need if, if you have shields uh, over your components uh, after the, the reflow oven, there may be multiple further steps um, before it goes to the X-ray. Um, but there, there are things you cannot see. You already, Mike, mentioned earlier uh, some uh, components that, that may be counterfeit, and those are the things that you with uh, extra high resolution inline systems you can catch right then and there. Uh, they are they would be looking differently, maybe not with the naked eye again, but uh, with the X-ray you can see there are some some uh, wire bond wires that doesn't that looks differently from from a counterfeit component to a real component, and and that can absolutely be be caught with X-ray. Uh, component placement and missing and all that, of course, uh, on the shields is, is obvious. Uh, BGAs, like I already said, I mean, they're, they are shrinking by the minute as well. Mm. Of course, everything, if you look at the newest phone, they are talking about a uh, nano height of, of whatever new uh, package type they have on there, and it's say it's still uh, two nanometers or whatever, something, right? So so it, it's just shrinking by the minute, and, and for that, you definitely need to be up front and, and on the forefront as well with the technology and, and make sure that you have the the high resolution uh, images to to again feed to the AI, AI and and uh, and operate obviously also at the end. Um, so yeah, AI goes in here as well. Of course, it's the more uh, X-ray uh, images you feed in, the, the better output it will get, and and the less the, the actual operators is needed. Only if there are some some extra critical components where the AI would say, well, it's better to have a human face here and and make sure that that's what I'm calling out. And that's also where we add uh, uh, that it's not only it, it bypasses the operator sometimes if, if there's some, call it simple defects, I mean, a missing component. Yes, okay, you don't need an operator to, to verify, yes, it is missing. Um, but there could be some other instances where it's more like, well, it's, it's, it's shifted by 24 degrees and, and the criteria says 25. Well, okay, maybe it's, it's okay that it's only 24 uh, degrees um, right. uh, shifted, right? So So it's... It all de it depends on, on the criteria, of course, and where this electronics is going. If, if it's something that's going uh, in a space rocket, that's a different story. That's a little bit more high end, of course, um, versus if it's going into a DVD player, which almost doesn't exist anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it really depends, of course, on the application. But, but the bottom line is, and the goal, of course, is that you, again, you, you attack all areas where you could potentially see some defects. 
and that goes from SPI, AOI, and X-ray, or the combination of those two, uh, AOI and AXI, um, to make sure that the product that that you produce is in fact uh, clear of errors and defects when it gets to the customer. You talked about an example of a DVD player. Um, that's what happens when we get you know older guys, experienced guys giving examples, right? You're going to pull the DVD player. I would have said the eight track player. So, you know, we all have our, our, <laughs> our line under in the my sand. seat, Mike. Under yeah. my yeah, yeah. Tr driver's I, seat. Yep. I had Pop one in right my in. car one day. I yeah. had a, in, in the seventies, I had an eight track player yeah. that I added hanging below the dash. Um, there you go. So Jasper, every time I go to the dentist and get x-rays, you know, they cover me with a lead blanket and then they leave the room. <laughs> and they when they press the button gives um, you a good feeling right yeah right exactly um and uh, now of course i'm not in a containment vessel like the machines you build would provide um so i understand why that's necessary but it did bring up the question uh a lot of times you know, like if you're flying on a plane um they'll say that each flight you know if you fly 12 times a year or 20 times a year, it's equivalent to one dental x-ray. So everything's kind of always benchmarked to one dental x-ray. But clearly, repeated exposure over, over time could be problematic to a person. I'm wondering, uh, does the x-ray technology, the bombardment of x-rays onto a, a physical uh, non-human, non-organic uh, thing like a, like a BGA or a, or a board, um, does that have any measurable degradation? Is there a limit to how many times um, a board can be exposed to X-rays, or um, the intensity of the X-ray, the you know, for lack of a better word, the wattage, the power, the amplitude, whatever, however it's measured? Um, are there limits? Is that a concern? Is it not a concern? Is, is it the equivalent to one dental X-ray? I mean, what, what's the? How, how do people who may be concerned about that? Um, get that answered. Yeah, I want to be clear. I mean, you can't see my arms, but I mean, I don't carry around the, the lead vest all the day here. So, so we we are safe. Luckily, there there are regulations for that. Uh, each state actually handle those things a little bit differently. Um, but for instance, when we install an X-ray, the state afterwards will have to go in and verify that there. We we do it ourselves, of course, upon leaving. So once it's installed, we do it like what we call X-ray survey. So we verify that everything is within spec and again it's different from state and country and whatnot um, and then you verify that well there is no extra leakage of, of this machine and then the state will have to come in afterwards as well and and do this survey and and let's say standardly we we would recommend to do that at least once a year um, and there are let's say small uh, personal dose meters that you can walk around with Again, depends on the state and the company. Some mm -hmm. companies require each person to carry one, and that we have one here in uh, in the office close to our X-ray machines, just as a safety precaution. If there is some sort of leakage, it would beep and go off, and you would know. Well, now there's there's more exposure than than you know, what you would uh, what you would want, uh, obviously. Um, but yes, to answer your question as well, that there are definitely components that that's more susceptible for for X-ray exposure than others. Uh, it's always a, a good thing to know what uh, each component was, was exposed to, and, and there are actually software tools uh, that can calculate that as well for a regular program. It can tell you this component was exposed by such and such uh, amount of RAD, and, and uh, I think not all, but more and more uh, components, especially the, the sensitive ones, BGAs uh, and things like that, camera chips and, and such, they, they by now do get more and more spec uh, sometimes and I would claim that maybe not always they, they know what they need to spec out as the uh, component manufacturer so they put it on the safe side and it's like well you can x-ray it well that's not going to work so so let's uh, do the second best uh, kind of thing so it, it's obviously a, a balance um, but it is very critical uh, sometimes I mean a chip and a resistor which are I would say considered old components these days sure um, you can x-ray them all day long and, and nothing will happen kind of thing. Whereas some, some very sensitive uh, camera chips or BGAs, yes, of course, or, or B, uh, let's say memory chips or things like that. There have been examples of, of erasing memory if, if you just stick it in there for, for hours and hours, which, again, nobody does, of course. Um, but, but we have done multiple studies with our customers where they were concerned 
uh, about the X-ray exposure and say, well, can we do something, collaborate here a little bit, and and we stuck it in there for half an hour, or two hours, and whatnot, and and then they verified if the components was working and and not afterwards. So so there there is a the, the fear is real, I would call it, but not to the extent where where you don't want to X-ray anything because again right. you, you need to look under those or through those BTAs and and with the three D uh, you can then verify that the the ball is there and and uh, sure the let's say hidden pillow is, is another thing and, and such. Yeah, I guess it's all at the end of the day, it's a risk benefit analysis. Um, one, yep. you know, yes, technically there's a risk. Um, what's the risk of not inspecting it properly? You know, that's probably a much greater risk. It's like I have a, a friend of mine that will never wear a seatbelt because they had a relative that died because the seatbelt locked up and they were trapped in their car and the car was on fire. And I mean, it, was, it happens. It's, it's probably it, one in a billion versus, you know, yeah. the, 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 the odds of, and millions of never saved. wearing a seatbelt. Right. Yeah. So it's, I, I, I get, you know, there's, what was the old saying? There's three types of, um, what was it? Three types of lies, uh, you know, lies, damn lies, and, and statistics. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we see what we want to see in that. Uh, before we leave the uh, the X-ray world and then wrap up our general conversation, um, uh, time just flies during this show. Um, tell me about you know we talked earlier about um, having uh, the computer interpret what the operator is seeing, so it's not just up to the operator. And I think in the X-ray world and maybe in the other worlds too, uh, computer tomography (CT) you know is incorporated into that because um, X-ray is you know if you think about it, X-ray itself is a pretty dull image. I mean, it's a black and white image or grayscale image. It's it's not brilliant color. Brilliant color uh, to a human eye, um, you know, it might be hard to get some of the nuances of it. But when you add CT to that, um, all of a sudden you it, it kind of rebuilds it in almost like an animated version of of you know uh, what we see with our eyes, uh, and it, and it can see things that and interpret things that we can't. So uh, how does CT work itself into x-ray uh, is, is that part of every x-ray machine is that a is, is that a, a separate feature um, what are the benefits uh, beyond just you know having a clearer image you know that that it provides the uh, user yep yeah so it, it really is uh, for the most part part of, of uh, as a feature for for every machine it's it's optional feature and and you can actually overlay some some colors to make it more let's say pretty for the for the human eye but still, my 24 years with with Miscom, uh, I mean, uh, there are some of those things that that we we do CT on is is mind blowing when you see them on a, on a picture afterwards because you you look through this mass and then you have all the inside details of here's the coil or here's uh, this and that. It, it's just mind blowing. It, it really is, and and there are so many let's say things you can do. So normally the the CT takes it a little bit longer because it needs multiple more images. So it's not necessarily something you want to do for, uh, call it inline production. Uh, you can do some sample inspection. Uh, you can do it either offline or, or inline as well, where you can do some sort of a planar CT. It's a, let's say a little bit more limited, but but faster version, uh, where you can then inspect uh, certain boards and and make sure that that you get the, the features highlighted that that you want. And especially uh, these days, I mean, BDAs have hidden pillow. That that's always uh, has been for the last I would say ten years. Uh, a talking topic. Well, do you have hidden pillows on your BGAs? And and X-ray CT specifically is is a very very good tool for that. And and once you have that picture of of the BGA component, uh, you can then slice and dice it any way you want, and you can analyze it really. And that that's what the CT is all about. It it really is more long term a, a lack tool where you can dig deep deep into the rabbit hole. And verify these uh, BGA balls, and and you can verify your oven profile and and uh, solder sort of paste amount and all that in in the same scope. Uh, and you can really slice and dice as much as you want, and and have time for, and then verify that everything is working. That could be a before and after a temperature test as well, a stress test of some sort, where you have uh, let's say micro cracks on the BGAs and things like that. So so there's uh, a lot of of u- good use for that. But again, it, it takes a little bit uh, extra time, so it's not something you would want to do on, on every single board. 
Uh, but for that, you will either have the, the offline X-ray station or, uh, let's say, you would, in, in certain instances, uh, verify every hundredth board where you would inspect it a little bit further and, and verify that you still have the same quality out of the, the yeah. production floor. I do love um, two of my favorite uh, terms for solder defects. Coming from an industry that is highly technical, highly engineering-centric, is head and pillow and tombstoning. <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah. you know, it, you don't need to be an engineer to visually get a, you know, uh, uh, right. to conce- have that a concept out of quick, what that, right? what, what, yes. what defect they're talking about. Um, okay, uh, last couple of questions. We have to wrap up. Um, like I said um, earlier, Ko Young is almost done um, engineering their X-ray machine, which they started <laughs> at the beginning of this program. And um, that's so, how long we talk. I know, right? Uh, so, what advice? Just and fast. Joel, right, that was just like that, right? Um, Joel's like, we got to do this because next time, Jess, Jesper can't get all the talk about one one type of machine. Um, it's all game, man. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, let's start with, with uh, Joel on this one. Um, what advice would you give to um, assemblers, manuf- electronic manufacturers, that are looking to invest in inspection equipment today? Um, what, what types of questions should they be asking you? And what types of questions should you be asking them? What's the best advice? Well, I think, you know, there's, there's a couple of couple of pieces to that, right? First and foremost, it kind of comes back to uh, the discussion we had a bit earlier, which is, you know, there's, there's, there's various options here, right? So make sure you understand uh, that, that each provider is, is in almost certain terms, providing something just a little bit different in terms of, uh, you know, 2D, 3D, how much 2D, how much 3D, it, it's, it's kind of like the orange juice uh, analogy, Mike. So, you know, you, you go to the supermarket and you, you pick up the orange juice container and it says, you know, 50% real orange juice or 20% real orange juice. And the rest is fillers and additives and all this other stuff, right? Uh, very hard to find that 100%, you know, Florida squeezed orange juice or whatever that commercial was, you know, back in the 70s. Back in the right? day, right. Back what, when what we were listening to yeah, our 8-track players. That's right, exactly. So, you know, there's there's differences in technology still being offered. So you, you have to understand that. You have to understand that, you know, not all 3D is created equal. Uh, again, there's there's some using uh, a much uh, greater uh, degree than others to, to get that measurement-based information. And, and that's critical uh, because that drives towards the data set, the data set, allows for all these things that we've been talking about for the last hour in terms of uh, the use of artificial intelligence, um, basically the uh, uh, realization of a smart factory and, and the lights out, et cetera, et cetera. It all, it all comes from that data set. So it's really important that you, you, you do, you look under the hood, you, you understand uh, how that company is, is providing the results that they're providing uh, similar to the to the AI question, the other thing that I really try to emphasize is that there's no such thing as a single machine purchase anymore, and you really have to look at this as a as a holistic approach. Uh, you're you're really you're really looking to partner with a company that can take you where you need to be, and you need to understand their roadmap. You need to understand what kind of things they're working on, how much. How much uh, of their revenue did they put back into R and D, et cetera, et cetera? You know what's coming next. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about the the data analysis software side of things, but tying it all together, uh, again, uh, tying into the uh, into the ERP, the MES system. Uh, you know, basically completing the, uh, uh, the 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 closed loop, if you will, on on making sure that everything is in fact tied together for this for this all encompassing smart factory initiative. So again, you know, if you make the wrong decision on day one, you may preclude the opportunity to take advantage of everything else that uh, uh, that you could otherwise have if if you make that sele- selection incorrectly. And uh, and I think the last piece and, and, and Jesper will get a kick out of this. 
don't do paper analysis, right? And and make a decision, right? You need to go out and see the equipment. You need to Absolutely. you need to Tires. test it. Take your boards. It's funny. I mean, now more than ever, it feels like that that because so much of the research is done, you know, online before they they even decide to to, to talk to us. Uh, th- there's a lot of preconceived notions uh, mm-hmm. and comparisons that are are not not always correct. Let's just put it that way. So you know, do do your homework. You know, get get in, get roll up your sleeves, and and uh, you know, ask the right questions. As far as from our perspective, again, uh, that 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 runs the gambit as well, right? I mean, typically it's it's just sitting and listening. What 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 are your issues, and and where, what are your aspirations as a company in terms of uh, you know your valuation of Smart Factory? There's various levels, and not everybody needs everything, right? So. You know, and there's there's also various uh, flavors of, of technology, even within both of our offerings, that might be better suited at a better price point for that customer's needs. So uh, there's a lot of listening uh, on the on the front end, and uh, you know, understanding of of you know what their current needs are today, but also where they where they're planning to go as as we go forward. Excellent, Jasper. Yeah, so I would uh, concur with, with what uh, Joel said, and what, one of our main tasks is to to listen to what the customer is saying, uh, not only, let's say, machine purchase-wise, but also future-wise. Okay, this is where we are going in the future, and then you collaborate and, and figure out the next best steps. But to go back to, to the machine purchase, I mean, it is crucial that, that the customers, our customers, uh, they, they bring our boards and they go out there and, and visit us because, again, uh, support structure is, is a huge well it's it's not a seller machine and run and I'll never see you again Joel said that already I mean it, it is you, you want to build up that relationship and, and visiting uh, the different offices and, and seeing their support structure is, is crucial uh, it could be a man, one man show uh, selling one machine and uh, <laughs> we'll see it. obviously out of a garage right <laughs> I can it, it's, that's not the case obviously um, but there was a time right Exactly. We've all, so we've all like, graduated from the garage. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. Don't underestimate the So you the want garage. to get out there and you want to see it and, and you want to listen to the customer. And, and we have obviously the best knowledge of our own machines. And, and there is no one machine fits all customers. There's always some sort of customization. This is what you need. This is the price point. This is, uh, let's say, where I see I will go in the future kind of thing. And, and then it's it's our job as a manufacturer to find the best machine for this need and say, okay, this is where you are today, but that machine that you're buying here is future safe. So it's, it's already have the latest technology. It can build into the AXI machine. If you would want to add that on later, it can build into the SPI machine. If you start with the EOI and, and things like that. So, so it's building the base and then obviously uh, support the customers and, and listen to their needs that that's really the key key factor here. Very sage advice. And my last question is, um, and we'll try and limit our answers to um, less than uh, a half hour each, <laughs> um, <laughs> or we'll have to go into a second second uh, part of this. Um, get out your crystal ball. Where do you see the future of inspection technology going? You know, maybe based on its trajectory, um, either from a hardware standpoint or a software standpoint or or some standpoint I'm not thinking of. Um, Jesper, why don't you start and then we'll end with uh, with Joel. Sure. Yes, I mean, it, it is both obviously hardware and software, but but I think uh, I know for sure that the software aspect will, will take leaps ahead of, of the hardware. I mean, hardware is, is, I wouldn't call it limited, but, but you can come out, I mean, uh, some of the phone manufacturers, they come out with a new phone every year. Uh, that doesn't mean, and, and you look at that, if, if you see that there are release notes and whatever, yeah, well, this one has a tiny bit better chip than right. whatever, whatever. So so it's really not groundbreaking technology all the time, and, and it can be, but but hardware, of course, is a huge factor. You want to have the right, the, the right uh, quality uh, hardware with the machine. Uh, you want to have the right resolution and, and the right 3D t- technology, as Joel also said. But I think here that the future in the next five, 10 years, software is absolutely 100% where we would see that the most benefit with the help from, from AI, of course, as we already talked about, 
that would take leaps, steps uh, in the next five, ten years. I'm hundred percent sure about it. And the hardware would seem, I wouldn't say sitting still, but it won't progress as much as the software. The the, the software will, even though we are way far these days with with AI integration and stuff, but you can only imagine what will happen in in five, ten years. That that I think where the the machines will be way more, uh, let's say, software-driven in the way that this is where we would see the advancements. Excellent. Yeah, I would, Joel? I would agree with that. Yeah, I think, you know, software is certainly uh, at the forefront at this point. Uh, you know, the use of the data, uh, more and more AI, is, as Jesper referred to, as, as, the, uh, as the chips become uh, more enhanced and, and the capabilities uh, continue to grow, uh, using all of that to continue to reduce the, the human uh, element, the need for human uh, interaction, et cetera. Um, and the connectivity piece, right, where we're feeding information back and forth, not to only ourselves, but to to every system up and down the line, right? And the, the CFX initiative is is playing a role in that. Um, on the hardware side, I, I agree. It's 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 going to be a little bit more uh, static, but I, I do certainly see a lot more uh, interest now on the back end, uh, even things like box build and vertical assembly, uh, where uh, maybe we change the, the form factor a little bit, the handling system to be able to uh, to do some things on the back end that are that are very different than, than the front end, which we've been talking about today, uh, you know, even as far as uh, uh, adapting the, the actual uh, inspection probe to to uh, maybe channel lever over a over a conveyor or or be installed in in another piece of automation that that we don't even build you know things like that so that 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 could certainly play a part as well and then of course again the the software that ties it all together so long way to go for sure and uh you know uh, every that's time we thing. talk every yeah that's uh, that's why we're here right it's that leave me alone well, it sounds like none of us are going to have to turn the light off uh, light off uh, after we shut the door um it sounds like uh we all have job security, and, and certainly <laughs> the need for inspection as boards get more complex and, and densities increase and component size decreases the need for optical inspection and x-ray and other technologies that evolve from all that um, it has never been higher. And um, one, of the, one of the challenges of our industry is, and I don't have to tell you guys this because you guys are affected by it as well, but... Um, just to state it for the record, I think one of the biggest challenges of our industry is our customers expect our products, electronic products in general, um, to every year be half the size, half the cost, twice as fast, last <laughs> like, you know, twice as long. It, it's it's almost diminishing returns. Even Ohm's law, uh, not Ohm's law, even Moore's law has been challenged. For sure. Like, are we at the end of Moore's law? Right. I mean, yeah. it's, it's it is this possible? Um, I remember back in the early uh, PC days, you know, Intel would have their 286, then their 386 processor, and their 486 processor, and their Pentium processor. And each time they released a new computer, the clock speed doubled. The original PC that my dad had, you know, that, that I used to, you know, practice coding on was an IBM PC with two floppy drives. And its clock speed was 4.7 megahertz. And the next Amazing. version, yeah, 4.7 megahertz. Uh, the, the, the next version that came out was 8, and then the next one was 16, and the next one was 32, 64, 128, 256, et cetera, 512. I'm going to run out yeah. of math skills if I keep doing that. Um, and every generation, every year or so, a new computer would come out. It would be twice the speed. And then it started being 50% increase. Then it was 20% increase. Then it was... To your point, Jesper, earlier about iPhones, you know, every year we have a new iPhone yeah. and every year they are a little bit faster and maybe an extra megapixel or two on the camera, but that's mostly a marketing move uh, on their, yeah. their side. Yeah. Um, I tend to buy, I used to buy iPhones every year when they came out and now I, I, I wait about two versions now Older. until there's something a little bit more yeah. significant. Yeah. But, but the whole point in that rant was um, the evolution of boards are becoming is, is so fast, and boards are so complex. And for many, the profit margin on these boards are minimal. Um, and and because you know, let's face it, a lot of um, 
users of electronics feel like this the electronic side of it is a commodity which, <laughs> which is <laughs> offensive but it's i can understand yeah. why they think that um so yeah. um proper inspection do it right the first time uh is is definitely driving our industry i mean now companies are making profits through optimization and because they've exactly. cut all the cost yeah. out of everything now they have they to have just be super excellence. efficient that's right. and operational they, they, they that's what, right yep. that's probably what separates you know profit from nonprofit is, is how how efficiently can we do things and of course quality and inspection just falls right into that so yep. um I'm 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 carrying your flag, you know, in the front of your parade, you know, for inspection. Appreciate that. Thank you. I think that's very well. Important. You know, the, the other thing we didn't even talk about today, Mike, uh, a whole other topic. But when we talk about the future of inspection, is is the migration into the uh, semiconductor assembly world, right? You know, both wafer level and packaging, and, and you mentioned Laura's law, and, and uh, so that's that's a horizon uh, uh, that we're that we're that we're. Uh, uh, on the cusp of right now as well yeah. as uh, people transitioning from the SMT world and, and uh, uh, migrating into this new space, so lots of lots of opportunity there. Those as worlds well. are those worlds are starting to merge a little bit. Um, they are. I know with my yeah. involvement with SMTA, uh, SMTA is getting involved on wafer level, um, yeah, um, ultra HDI things that traditionally were down the river in, in another village, uh, and yeah. and th there is an, a good little bit of emerging at least around the edges which is great yeah. because well it starts board with designers need package to know, applications yeah. right right board yeah. designers need to know how the, the the real life problems of assemblers we need to understand what the board designers were thinking when they came up with this you know way to build a board and and the, the wafer level people you know if, we're all in the same village we're all handing off you know like a like a baton race yeah. you know we're That's handing right. off the next baton and all of a sudden the next baton weighs you know, nine nine hundred pounds, and we can't carry it. <laughs> we need to know that, you know, ahead of time. Uh -oh. So, um, yeah, it's it's good that we're starting to integrate. Um, Joel Scutchfield, Co. Young, uh, Jasper Likey, Viscom. Thank you so much for uh, being my guest today and for educating me and hopefully um, my audience on the attributes and technology behind inspection uh, and and the benefits and the um, advice uh, in terms of best practices. I really appreciate your, your sage oh, uh, information. Okay, Dean, I appreciate being on him, definitely. We'll do it again anytime. Absolutely. Let's do it. It's been I have a feeling we're yeah. not going to run out of subject matter uh, <laughs> in, in, in your world. Yeah, right? you, you, you can tell, Mike, we have a lot we can talk about, right? Uh, <laughs> All good. And we, and, yeah, and exactly. we really like doing it, don't we, Jesper? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, when you Good love stuff. what you do, you never work a day in your life. So neither of you are working very hard. Yeah, you're, you're just, <laughs> it all comes naturally. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. And if my audience um, uh, would like to get a hold of uh, uh, Joel or Jesper, I'll have their contact information in the show notes. So if you're listening to this on your favorite podcast app, go to that podcast app and look at the show notes and you'll find contact information for my guests there. If you're watching this on the YouTube channel, on the Reliability Matters YouTube channel, uh, just look down where it says show more and uh, click on that and you'll see the, um, the contact information there as well as other information about this episode. So again, Joel and Jespier, thank you so much and I look forward Appreciate to our it. next conversation. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Yep. Look forward to the opportunity, Mike. Always a pleasure. Me too. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on your favorite podcast app. If you're watching this podcast on the Reliability Matters YouTube channel, be sure to click the like, subscribe, and bell icons to be notified when new episodes are released. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. A special thanks to the Printed Circuit Engineering Association's PCB Chat at PCBChat.com and Ascendo Reliability at Reliability.fm for syndicating this show. Thanks also for your questions and episode suggestions. Please keep them coming. I love to hear from you. Send comments or suggestions to Mike at MikeConrad.com. Just remember, that's Conrad spelled with a K. To learn more about the Reliability Matters Podcast, please visit the Reliability Matters Podcast website at ReliabilityMattersPodcast.com. Once again, thanks for listening or watching. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and perhaps most importantly, keep doing it right. And I'll see you again in two weeks.
Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.